Thank you. Um, again, it's been it's been a great pleasure to be here yesterday and today. Thank you for for having us. And uh, I had to, based on, on yesterday's uh, discussions, I decided to change and update my presentation a bit to kind of follow up on some of the things that have been told and some of the questions that have been asked in, in the course of, of the conference, uh, this conference so far. Um, so uh, the, the big part mm, of this conference has obviously been devoted to the uh, objects and artifacts that were created during the Holocaust, whether by the Holocaust, uh, uh, or, or during the Holocaust by the Holocaust survivors, or um, right after the war, or after the war, but also by the Holocaust survivors. And uh, I mean, that's that's something that uh, that is, is is for us historians or museum people important to find those objects to. Um, to collect them, to save them for the future generations. And of course, we will be finding those objects. They will be, uh, as, a, as a, those, those bottles thrown into the ocean of time, they will be coming to the, to the ashore of our, our, our uh, attention from time to time. And um, that's the case that I wanted to share with you of, 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 of some story like this that, that reached our shore at the Galicia Jewish Museum a couple of years ago near the, in the city of, uh, of town of Wieliczka, not far from Krakow in 2008, a green notebook is being found. Uh, Richard Apte, 1939, 1940. Richard Apte was, later on we found, he was uh, born in 1923 and this was the notebook he prepared for the school year of 1939, 1940, the school year that has never came. Um, and inside of this notebook, we have drawings made by Richard Apte in 1941, 1942. Uh, Richard Apte was of a Jewish origins from a Jewish family. He was uh, raised in Kazimierz, attending a Hebrew gymnasium, but yet he was very much uh, affected by, by Christianity, by, um, by uh, uh, Jewish-Christian relations, and that's something that will be visible in the entire collection. Uh, and again, th these are there are some pet patterns. It was told yesterday already with the authors of, or, or artists that been creating before the war, and often those those works will be full of colors, more optimistic. And then it's not not a surprise that during the war, things are changing. And it was the same with Upton, the same notebook. There are drawings from 1939, uh, which are still colorful, which are still still full of optimism, as if here he's he's helping himself. He's looking for a future ways of, of he dreams about the future. Uh, but then, 1941, 1942, things are changing. And that's his autoportrait uh, from 1941. At the time, he was 18 years old. So the point is that, yes, there are going to be materials like this that will be uh, coming out from the lockers, basements, uh, uh, and so on and so on. And we will need to work with them. Um, but we, we, we talk about... We, we talk about art that was created by the victims. We, it is often, or recently in Krakow, there was a very interesting exhibition of the um, art on the Holocaust created by the bystanders. It was uh, created by Erika Lehrer and uh, Roma Syndica, Holocaust in Polish folk art, representation of the Holocaust in Polish folk art. But what about artworks that were created by the perpetrators? Um, so let me tell you a short story. This is the photo from a house in Tübingen. This gentleman on the left is, has bought apartment, and the apartment was still filled with uh, objects of the previous owners. And on the wall of this apartment, there are those two lovely uh, portraits of a German soldier and his wife. Uh, the portraits were, ma were made during the time of the war. We know it from, this, uh, from the discussions with the son of this gentleman, of this, of this soldier, uh, based on the photographs that were still in the family archive. Um, the problem is that the portraits were made on the fragments of the Torah scroll. Both of them. Uh, actually, fragments from the Exodus. You shall not make false gods for yourself. So um, how about this kind of art? Whether art, uh, and the subject of this conference is, is precisely art and the Holocaust. So here we have uh, art and the Holocaust that encapsulate very much uh, the story of the Holocaust itself, a final sign of the Nazi German victory over the Jews. Uh, they did not only kill them, but they took what was left and used for their own purposes. We've learned as a, a preparation of the exhibition. 
what else we could do with that uh, at, the, at, the, at the museum. So we've built an exhibition. Uh, for the, during the preparation of this exhibition, we were able to find all the information about the Nazi officer, about this German officer. Uh, when, when he was born, where he served, he was, he was a Wehrmacht officer, he served in the mechanized unit, uh, driving a truck, uh, he was in, in France, in, in Poland, in France, and then in Ukraine, uh, he was a photographer, so among the things that were left in this house, there was an entire collection, hundreds of photographs of, from, from the wartime. Um, we had no information about the Torah. Those people that created this Torah, those people uh, that, that uh, used this Torah, were gone. And information about them were gone as well. Uh, through the work of, or through the help of Chief Rabbi of Poland and, and specialists on, on Torah uh, in, in Israel, we were able to tell that because of the, the writing, uh, the Torah was most likely created by some Sephardic um, communities. Uh, but because of the discussions with his son, we were able to more or less locate the time when the portraits were created, 1942, 1943. Uh, and based on his uh, service list, we knew that he would be in, uh, in Hungary and Ukraine, uh, Eastern Front at that time. So fortunately, and I think that's a, a, some kind of, of, of just or revenge, the portraits were made upside down. So when we wanted to display uh, the, the, those objects, the question was, do we put the Torah fragment upside down or the portrait upside, upside down, which for us it was uh, quite obvious. And uh, again, the question is what those objects actually are whether they, uh, as, a, as, a, as a destroyed, desacralized fragment of the Torah, they should be buried at the Jewish cemetery. But you can't separate the face of this German officer from that, that particular uh, fragment of the, of the Torah scroll. So, so we, it was fascinating to look at the discussions between all rabbis and, you know, as, as always, four rabbis had six different opinions of, of, of what to do with that. <laughs> but, but yes, the, the object has been presented and, and it, uh, after some time it went back to Tübingen, where it was found, and it's now in, uh, supposed to be on display in Stuttgart. Uh, but when we went there a couple of years ago, it was not. But the point is that, that um, there is, uh, there is uh, more than, uh, I mean, the Holocaust in art can, can, uh, doesn't need to mean only the Holocaust, uh, the art created by the Holocaust victims during the Holocaust. Uh, it's a it's, it's wider term. And, And in the Galicia Jewish Museum, we deal with a kind of all the possible angles, and we had those exhibitions based on the objects, and we, uh, very important for us is also to look at the contemporary representations of the Holocaust. And of course, we, you know, the Holocaust is been, being uh, presented in different ways, in more traditional ways, where, you, where the key object of the exhibition would be the object itself, and in modern days, you have modern technology, where there, where there will be some objects, like in the Pauline Museum, but there will be uh, uh, lots of multimedia uh, uh, that will be displaying and analyzing this, uh, this entire thing. Um, but, uh, of course, the Holocaust can be responded also through the contemporary photography, uh, through the photographs that, are, uh, take, that were taken today and are showing us the space that exists today. Uh, and yesterday it was raised, uh, one of the questions was, uh, that was asked or discussion was what are the difference, be the difference between the U.S. museums, Holocaust museums, and, and European uh, museums. And there was a couple of answers. I'm, sh I'm sure all of them are right. But I, was, uh, I think that there are two other um, things that makes us different. Um, first of all, I think that Holocaust museums in, in the state are big because they need to tell the entire story. Each and one of them will need to tell pretty much the same story of the pre-war Jewish life in Europe, of the mass killing and persecution of the, persecution of the Jews in, in Germany, mass killing of the Jews across the Europe, and then the final arrival to the safe heaven of the United States. Whether you're in Los Angeles, in Skokie, or in, 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 in New York, the story has to be pretty much the same. Um, so that's why they, they need to be larger than the Jewish Museum of, of, of Riga, which doesn't need to tell us about the situation of the Jews in France, or in Hungary, or in Krakow. Uh, it focuses on the local story. And I think that's a very important thing that we often forgot, uh, or, 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 or tend to forget because of the influence of the uh, kind of American uh, uh, style, is that we have something very van valuable, very uh, uh, unique. We have the space where this, this, this all happened. 
we are in the actual original space where the Holocaust happened, especially in this, this part of, of Europe. Um, and therefore, we can focus on this uh, deconstructed, this, this uh, 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 fragmented visions of, of the story. Um, second of all, I think that Holocaust museums and states need to serve two purposes, uh, or not only in the states, but in other places that are not Eastern Europe. They need to be a museum as an educational center, but also they often serve as a memorial to the victims of, of the Holocaust. Um, here in, in, in Eastern Europe, we don't need to uh, follow this path because this entire region is one large memorial, in a sense, to what has happened to the Jews. Um, and of course, we, and, and after the war, right after the war, there has been memorials built, and the memorials are built uh, until today. We yesterday have seen the, the memorial in, in Hungary. Um, but I think this photo, and that's actually one of the photos that starts the exhibition uh, at the Galicia Jewish Museum, and encapsulate the entire story. I mean, here you see the last standing tombstone of the pre-war Jewish cemetery of Płaszów. Uh, the the Płaszów cemeteries were, um, were destroyed by the Germans in 1941, 1942, and on that particular site, the Germans built concentration camps. For unknown reason, this one tombstone was left behind. Out of thousands and thousands of tombstones that were flattened, used to pave the roads as a building material, this one uh, survived, and it's still standing. 70 or 80 years later, it's still there. But the void surrounding this, this emptiness, tells us about the, the contemporary situation. I mean, the Jewish, the Jewish uh, world in this part of, of Europe, in most places, is gone. In a sense, how it was in, in 70 years ago. What was left are those tiny objects, uh, uh, crumbles of, of that past that are still standing. And of course, we could build, and there are plans to, 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 to build a memorial at this very site. Uh, but I think, again, we're losing something. Because to take care and, and to preserve this location precisely as it is, perhaps that would be the best uh, memorial. And again, if you go 1.5 kilometer from that particular uh, tombstone, that will tell us pretty much uh, you know, everything about, about the, 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 in the symbolic well about the Holocaust, you also see everything about the pre-war Jewish life. This is the plaque that was erected at the city um, hall building of Kazimierz in 1920s by the Jews, by the Jewish artist Henrik Hochmann, depicting the arrival of the Jews to Poland. Uh, in 1920s, you see the Jews uh, uh, coming, kissing the, the, the hand of the Polish king, represented here as an, as an angel. So again, we don't really need to create those entire narrations in one location, uh, uh, um, because we have crumbles, we have original artifacts of that past visible throughout our spaces. Um, in Krakow, um, there is other museum, Schindler's Museum, absolutely, you know, great museum and, and, and fine. My only problem with that particular museum is that among, in the section devoted to the, to the, to the um, ghetto, uh, the museum built an built, um, uh, artificial fragment of the ghetto wall. My problem is that the original fragment of the ghetto wall is located 200 meters away. <laughs> And we're drawing people from going to that particular location to see the original thing, and instead of them, we're offering them something artificial. So um, the, the challenge of, of building and commemoration, commemorating uh, in this particular part of the world is, I think, how to preserve what is out there today. Not how to build new structures, not how to overshadow, how, not how to uh, 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 create our vision of the past, but how to preserve what is here um, today. So, uh, again, you, you don't need to go to Auschwitz to learn about Holocaust. You can go to Zakopane, where there was a Jewish community of 1939, established just a few months before the outbreak of the war. And again, this is the only left trace after this Jewish community of Zakopane, uh, a few uh, tombstones um, overgrown uh, in, in the site where they were smashed by the, by the, by the Germans. Um, 
so the, the, the way this exhibition deals, or the way that Jewish past has been approached many times in the past, I mean, in, in, in the post-war reality, was uh, people would go to the, or photographers would go to the sites where the synagogues or cemeteries would, would, would still stand, take photographs, and there's a beautiful collections of the photographs of the synagogues from Poland from 1970s and 80s. The, the thing is that most of those, if not all, photographs were taken in black and white to highlight kind of this, this, this aspect, this, this very uh, sensitive and, and symbolic fact that, that this is story of the past. This is something that, that doesn't really belong to the present day. In, in our museum, uh, the exhibition created by uh, Chris Schwartz, the photographer Jonathan Weber, researcher, with photographs um, updated by, uh, by Jason Francisco, uh, has a different approach. We are, w want to highlight the fact that those objects exist today, and they are equally part of the past and part of the present, and will be, hopefully, part of our future. They belong to us, in a sense, we are the present-day guardians of that space. Um, you, you can tell, you can, oh, you can tell the story uh, uh, not only for the things that exist, like here, you can also tell the story for the things that doesn't exist. This is the site where the grand synagogue of the city of Oświęcim, Auschwitz, used to be. It's gone. So what should we do? Rebuilding the synagogue, uh, building memorial? Uh, uh, for me, keeping this as this void, as this painful gap in our uh, otherwise landscape of the living city is a very powerful sign of our memory. Um, the destruction, the destruction con uh, that, uh, the, the question of commemoration is not something that that, that, that been in, in Poland uh, uh, that started right after the war, meaning the Poles did not, first thing after the, the end of the war, the first thing we wanted to do was to commemorate the victims, especially the Jewish victims. So for the next, in many places until today, you see that the objects of the past of the Jews were utilized, were colonized. We as the Poles colonized the post-Jewish space. Jews were gone, we took their houses, we took their fields, we were the one that described the narration, we decided who is, who is commemorated at the memorials erected in 1960s, 70s, we were the one that wrote the books, we were the one that assigned us the role of the heroes, us the role of the victims, and the Germans the role of the perpetrators. And so we've been using this space with sometimes more acknowledgement of, the, of its Jewish origins and sometimes as, as here without any acknowledgement of, of, of the Jewish uh, past. Things have been changing, and, and again, uh, I mean, the, 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 the Jewishness today can be described not only through the objects of the Holocaust, but also through the pre-war glory of some of the sites. Um, according to the, the, the challenge is that according to the Holocaust, um, United States Holocaust Memorial, the Germans created during the entire time of the war in the entire occupied Europe, 44,000 concentration and slave labor camps, 44,000. A uh, big part of them were located here in Eastern Europe. So how do we commemorate 44,000 sites? Um, some of them are like here, Pruchnik, 55 Jews killed in that very, very location. Uh, here near Brzostek, 700, 364. I could go on and go on and go on and go on. Um, so again, what is here is that instead of building a huge memorials, instead of building uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 new places that would draw new attention, I think our uh, mutual uh, uh, effort should be devoted to going to those places, to seeing those places, to paying attention to, the, to these local dimensions of, of, the, of the Holocaust. Płaszów, again, concentration camp in the center of Kraków. Uh, which for many years was overgrown and used as a park. And today there is the discussion, there is the idea of building a new memorial there, and there has been discussions between the city historical museum that will run the project and the inhabitants. And inhabitants are, are today are really offended by the fact that someone is taking away from them their park, where they've been running and, and, and walking their dogs and <coughs> sun bathing and so on and so on. At the site of the concentration camp, uh, how do we, how do we um, depict, how do we commemorate individual crimes? So here is a, is a, is a, is a house, is a barn in, in a small village of Gniewczyna in Poland where at some point of the war, Poles uh, uh, caught 
their Jewish neighbors that were hiding in the forest, locked them in the barn. Uh, they raped the women for a couple of days. They tortured them, asking where's the mythical Jewish gold. And they, when, when they were done, they uh, called the German police that killed them. How do we commemorate that story? We're telling this story in our museum in Kraków. 150 kilometers from Gniewczyna. In Gniewczyna, this story is not being told because the people that done this are still, or been still alive, and their kids and their grandkids are still alive. Auschwitz. Um, different dimension. And I mean, how, what, what is, what is how, how to find a mutual way of commemorating this story and that story? And the memory, the memory can, be, can, be, can be preserved. This is a small village uh, where this clump of trees is precisely where the Jewish cemetery used to be. For 70 years after the war, the farmers would plot around it. Uh, and for many years, they would lit, on November 1st, they would lit the candles at the site of the former Jewish cemetery. There was no memorials, no Jews left. So the memory can be transferred from one generation to another generation. That the past can be commemorated even without memorials. We don't need, those people of, of this village didn't need a grand memorial. They didn't need a grand museum located in that, in that particular location. They needed a certain sensitivity to pass the simple story of the Jewish neighbors that lived and were killed in that very town. And the survivors, been, 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 been trying to commemorate and depict the Holocaust uh, and, and, and at the same time move forward by building such a wailing walls for, uh, out of the fragments of those shattered tombstones. They would be, they would be building such a walls. Uh, and I think that's one of the most symbolic uh, photographs we have in, 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 in this exhibition because in a way they wanted to, um, they were also looting together pieces of their life to move forward. Um, but, Poland is Poland, Poland is complicated. So uh, it's not like we have 44,000 concentration camps uh, any longer. This is a, a Pust, uh, Pustkov, a town, a small town of Pustkov, which recently decided to build from a scratch a, a, a concentration camp replica, which is not even one scale one to one, it's smaller. If you see a, a man, he is like as, almost as high as, as, as this, this guard tower. So on top of the you know, lack of spaces, on, to on top of the memorials that do not mention the Jews, on top of the actual memorials, you have those, those uh, 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 um, curious uh, uh, places which, which offers yet a different vision of, of the Holocaust as a tourist attraction. Uh, the, the, the official statement of, of, of the city council of the, that town is that it is to educate but it is also to create jobs and also to create more attention to bring people to this town. Um, so again, Grand Synagogue of Dąbrowa Tarnowska. Uh, just 10, 15 years ago, it was completely in ruins. It was located just on the, on the main square of this town. It was renovated. And, 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 and on one hand, that's a very positive aspect. I mean, you know, after many, many years of, of, of seeing this, this synagogue in ruin, today we see it kind of resembling the former gr glory. The only problem with this museum is that inside, among, you know, small exhibition devoted to the Jews, there is also an exhibition of fossils, of Polish folk art, and the actually fragment of the American bomber uh, that was shot down by the Germans in 1940, whatever, too. Perhaps, it would be better to preserve it as a ruin. I think, again, this is Tarnów. Um, this Tarnów uh, Bima protected, preserved for the future generations, but not, not restored. I think it tells us, again, much, in much better way, the story the, of the Jews of Tarnów. They've been there. They've been the important part of the landscape of the town. They had this great synagogue, also located just off the main square. But they, today, are gone. And probably, they'll never be Jewish life uh, in Tarnów uh, again. And yet another example, restored synagogue used as a, sh a shop, as a store. So there are tricky uh, challenges and, and questions of, of, a, when, 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 of, of you know, when you're thinking about how to commemorate. Sometimes the obvious solutions turn not to work in the best ways. Because uh, you know, kids coming to this synagogue will not learn too much about the Jews. Um, 
So the exhibition, you know, the, the one last thing, a feature of the exhibition is, is that um, it was a conscious decision. The exhibition is built out of five sections. The conscious decision was not to include any human being on the photographs, almost 120 photographs in the first four sections. Again, to highlight the fact that the Jews are gone from all of those places that have been depicted there, the Jews are gone today. But there is a fifth section that is telling us about the revival of the Jewish life in present day Poland, which is solely depicted human beings. Uh, those that are coming in, those that are from Krakow, like this Holocaust survivor, member of the community, and so on, so on. Um, so this is w why this exhibition is, is, is not purely historical. I mean, we do our historical part by exhibitions I, I showed you at the beginning, and that's why also I wanted to show them to you. But this exhibition is more about art. This is the artistic view on, on the issue of the Jewish heritage and the Holocaust in Poland these days. This is how it looks at the museum. And the funny thing is that people do enjoy this, muse this, this exhibition. It's been uh, traveling across, across the world uh, recently to South Africa. Um, and again, it was very moving to see those kids in South Africa looking and working with those, with those particular images because there is something that they can refer to, this absence of presence, this space that is so heavily marked with trauma. This is, these are some unique qualities that we can discuss whatever the reasons, whatever the, the, the backgrounds. And, um, and I think that's uh, one of the things that the art uh, part can... Um, why it's our artistic views on, on the Holocaust are so important. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, questions? Uh, yeah. So, uh, I have a small comment. Uh, well, of course, all these fake concentration camps and so on, that's something mind-blowing. I thought I've seen everything, but it turns out not everything. Uh, concerning this very term, post-Jewish space, I think one important thing we have to remember is that we perceive it as a post-Jewish space because the Jews are not just gone, but were br well, brutally murdered more or less on the very same site. Yeah, so here in Latvia we quite often speak about post-Jewish space, but we still are not too comfortable with, let's say, post-German space in relation with the Baltic German community. Still, we are reflecting on it. And uh, I think best uh, thing on trying to understand what happened to this post-Jewish space, there is a, a poem by Yiddish poet uh, Mane Leib uh, about abandoned synagogues. He writes that he sees all these synagogues where there uh, the smell of dust and they're being abandoned with empty windows and he writes and he writes how tragic it is and only in the end of the poem you read that he writes about Manhattan, about Lower East Side, the synagogues that were abandoned just because people moved out to more upscale neighborhoods. Yeah, and so uh, now you have a number of Facebook groups which are dedicated to abandoned synagogues of Lower East Side in Manhattan. So completely different story, but, uh, and which leaves us with completely different feeling that here, so, uh, so I think we could, I know that you're very short on time, uh, but I think it's something well worth discussing. Why do we perceive a post-Jewish space exactly in the way we do, not only because the buildings are abandoned and never come back, but also what happened to the people. And now, Oliver. Yeah. If you want to respond. Yes, I mean, of course, I mean, there's a, there's a, a in, in I mean, uh, there's a chain of life, and, and, and as a part of the life, uh, you, 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 you grow, you, you move, and you left, you're leaving things behind. So, so, of course, that's very, very true, and when we, where we sometimes having, uh, are having visitors that say, okay, it's not so wrong because in Manchester recently the synagogue has been sold to whatever. Yes, I mean, that's, uh, Ilya's comments is very, uh, very true. Those, this chain of life that is still strong in Western Europe, in the States, has been torn apart in, in, in Eastern Europe. Those Jews were never given the chance. It was not their decision to move. It was taken away from them. They were killed. And often these are the only things, only fragments of the Jewish world that still exist. So that's why it's so painful to see those synagogues being used in, in different, um, different ways. Well, thank you for this great presentation. Um, I think that's something we talked about yesterday, that this con connects Europe, but sets of Europe from the US, for example. I think it's not only Eastern Europe. I once lived in a house 
uh, that I only learned then that was uh, taken from a Jewish family in 1936 by my proprietor's family, so what to do? Um, move out on the spot or make a plaque, I don't know. Or um, Stolperstein. And um, especially in Franconia, you had all those sites because that was a region where you had a synagogue for 600 years in, in all, well, some of the synagogues only were like 150 years old, but all over the landscape in, a, in, in a quite the manner that you did it. Um, but I wanted to, to just ask two questions. The first one is, um, you mentioned the Schindler factory and you mentioned uh, the problem of economy. And of course, there's a tension as well. Many of the sites, and especially the Schindler factory, um, also um, appease the entertainment aspect very much or, or, or know that many of the people that come are there, but they maybe not only to be entertained, but to maybe to learn, but as tourists, of course. And this is a problem, of course, in Berlin. This is a problem in Krakow, or maybe not a problem, but a challenge, yeah? So, so I would like to learn about that. And the second thing is, um, it's not only the void, but it's also the, the competing narratives. Um, whenever you go east of the, uh, uh, of the Iron Curtain, uh, you always have discussions on how about the competing systems. For example, in, in Rostock, the former Stasi, the secret police prison, which was my office, by the way, but only later, um, uh, was then uh, was built on the premise of the former synagogue that was burned down in 1938. And so our um, uh, mayor, who was very keen on tourism, thought, uh, well, there's this turret from the uh, Soviet T-34, or uh, T whatever, you know, the turret from the, from the tank that we found, and uh, there's the Stasi prison, so, so why not put uh, um, an exhibition on both the synagogue and the Jewish community uh, and the turret and the German suffering during the bombing and the Stasi all in my all in this former prison that was built in 1960 and I mean discussions like this we have all over Europe or east of the east, uh, uh, east of the Iron Curtain um, yes um, so, so as, as for uh, tourism industry uh, of, of course, that's something that is that is very visible, and and today big part of economy of of certain areas um, of Poland are more or less connected uh, to the Jewish heritage. And again, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is that th this this fact, the simple fact, this Jewish heritage still exists. And if you want to learn something of about the modern, uh, uh, I mean, the, the the roots of the modern Judaism of the Ashkenazi Judaism. This is where they are. I mean, if, if you, you know, Poland at the end of 18th century was the absolute center of the Jewish world. 75% of all the Jews of the world at the end of 18th century lived in Poland. Even in 1930s, where, when, when the largest Jewish community was already in the States, in you know number of Jewish newspapers published in Poland was greater than all the other European countries together. So even in 1930s, Poland you still would be a center of, 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 of the cultural, uh, uh, academic life, YIVO Institute today in New York was not built in New York. It was created in Vilno. So even in the 30s, this part of, of the world use was, was a center of the Jewish civilization. It is the war that changed that. But nevertheless, both the fragments on, of, of the war uh, and, and the fragments of the Jewish life are still visible. I mean, there is no other place. In, in all of the world, where you will find so many traces of Jewish life standing so close to so many traces of Jewish death. This is here. So what do we do with the people that are coming? I'm, I was born in Kazimierz, and Kazimierz 30 years ago was a really uh, a, a dilapidated, uh, run-down district without, without no tourism. And people t sometimes uh, uh, kind of refer to that particular Kazimierz saying that it was more genuine than it is today, bustling with you know, electric carts that will take you to Wieliczka salt mine, Auschwitz, and uh, you know, concert in one day, and you have fancy hotels and restaurants and so on and so on. I mean, I think as, as a person that, that you know, was, was, was born and raised in, in Kazimierz, I think that this Kazimierz of 80s and early 90s has, has actually taught us very little about the pre-war Jewish life that was much more like what we have today, bustling with life, with noises, with, 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 with you know, smells and different sh uh, colors of, of the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish world. 
So, so definitely there, there are problems related to, to, to um, this tourism industry. But otherwise, uh, I think um, this is the only way we can preserve this, 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 um, lots of this heritage. We can preserve it because there are people that want to see it, because there are money coming from those visits uh, that can be then devoted to renovations or upkeeping of those, of those sites. Um, so I think it's a tricky, tricky, tricky problem, and we, we as, a, as a museum, as a part of the Jewish community, kind of uh, widely speaking, are taking our voice and trying to to, to fight some of those most um, horrific uh, um, aspects of that. But in many sense, we accept this as a part of the uh, the culture uh, and as a part of the landscape. Thank you for a really fascinating presentation. Can I ask you, as somebody who's sitting in the heart of what was Jewish civilization, what you actually think when you go around the world and see Holocaust museums, um, particularly in cities that actually had no effect at all on the Holocaust? Uh, so, and do you think that these cities are finding the right formula to generate memory and education. I'm just interested in, in your views on looking at it from the outside. Well, I mean, uh, there are different different ideas and the different visions of for the Jewish Holocaust museums. And I think, I mean, memory is important. And, and, and because, uh, also because of, of the survivors that, that arrive to those places like Los Angeles has nothing to do with anything, you know, even closely related to the Holocaust. But yeah, you'll have a Holocaust memorial, a Holocaust museum in Los Angeles, Miami. Same story. They are there because this is where there were survivors. So for them, I think the memory is important. But yes, I mean, if you look at the, at the pools, at the surveys that have been done recently across the world, in the US, in Europe, and in Poland, about the Holocaust education, clearly we do things wrong. I mean, despite all those museums, despite the millions or billions of dollars pumped to Holocaust education, things are not really going into the right direction. People are still unaware of the fact, you know, what the, what the Holocaust was, who was actually the victim, how many victims, why it's different. And actually, we see gradually, especially in the last, uh, last maybe the decade, we see that, you know, uh, people are getting kind of tired of the Holocaust. And this, this, you know, the question of, are the Jews are using Holocaust for their own purpose, and so on and so on, more and more people say yes. So clearly, we, we're doing something, something wrong with Holocaust education, and perhaps, and that's something that is, is a troubling thought, but perhaps we are devoting, in the Holocaust education, we are devoting too much effort to the victims. I mean, the Holocaust did not happen because of the Jews. The, the, the Jews that we commemorate in, in, in all those museums were the results of the Holocaust. We will not learn how to stop Holocaust by learning the stories of the victims we might be able to stop the Holocaust by learning stories of the perpetrators. And yet, the perpetrators in the Holocaust museums are, are not the key element of the story. And again, it don't take me wrong. I would separate the memory, commemorations of the victims. I think, yes, all the names, all the stories should be, should be uh, preserved for the future. But commemoration doesn't mean education. And again, I think at some point we'll need to see and look for other ways, new ways to educate, uh, and perhaps, um, perhaps in, in that in that new, uh, new 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 way, we should we should start devoting more time to the perpetrators to see how people that were born in normal, happy families, uh, 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 whether it's you know perpetrators of, from Germany or perpetrators from Poland or Hungary, wherever, and perpetrators of, of any crime, how they end up holding the, the rifle and pulling the trigger. That's the challenge. Now, how you ended up looking at the battle and at the rifle. Uh, rifle. No? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. That was, uh, thank you. I hope uh, you'll ask more questions privately. And uh, I just came back from Zhezhov, and uh, I saw the whole experience of commemoration or lack of it. Uh, in that area, and uh, what you mentioned and what you saw about the 
photo uh, photographs, the photos of the places where the camps were or the where the Jews were killed in mass graves, uh, you think this attempt to kind of to grasp things that are impossible to to kind of uh, understand in a making by contemporary art or like in Houston Holocaust Museum to take 1,200 shots of the sky above mass graves or concentration camps. So what does it tell us? So I think that your perspective is very interesting to see because part of these old Jewish synagogues and cemeteries are actually, there are other monuments now there. Yes. There are parks. There's, they are used as a public space in very different ways. So, so thank you. It was very interesting. Thank you. I mean, yeah. I think it was not about giving right answers, but about kind of starting asking right questions. Yeah. I think that's the challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.